Quipper is Habitat Restoration. Quipper is Science. Quipper is Protecting Infrastructure. Quipper is Recreation. Quipper is the Coastal Wetlands Planning Protection and Restoration Act. I'm Corey Miller, Director of Community Resilience for the Coalition Restore Coastal Louisiana. We thank you for joining us for the kickoff of our 2021 Restoration on the Half Show. We're excited to bring you this three-part series that provides an overview of our coastal land loss crisis, a deeper dive into some prominent issues, and some profiles of community leaders that are making an impact. Today, we explain the science and processes that are shaping Louisiana's coast and the hopes for restoration. As well, we introduce you to CRCL and some of the work that we do. 
Tomorrow, we will hear from prominent journalists who are covering these coastal issues and engage in a discussion. Lastly, on Thursday, we will celebrate several of our community-based partners who are working on the front lines of our coast to bolster their community's resilience despite these challenges. Life along Louisiana's coast is a balancing act between the bounty of natural resources and the dynamic constant change of the landscape, all with the ever looming perils of the next hurricane sprinkled on top. It is important to acknowledge that long before us, there were plenty of indigenous people who found that balance and steadied themselves on the tightrope. As we are gathering, and if you're in front of a computer or smartphone, we encourage you to go to native-land.ca and acknowledge the territory of the people who stood long before and whose descendants remain. Feel free to go ahead and enter it into the chat. Today, we will cover what we call Louisiana's Coast 101, an in-depth overview of how our coast was formed, the decisions and driving forces that result in the tragic loss of our wetlands, and the solutions that are available via restoration projects. We can't save all of our coasts, and we won't be able to restore our wetlands to the conditions that existed 50, 75, or 100 plus years ago. But there is hope. We may rebuild and maintain critical wetland areas that provide habitat for an abundance of wildlife and fisheries, as well as a buffer from damaging winds and waves driven by storms. The Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana was formed to raise awareness of these issues and to advocate policies, plans, and projects that will help our residents continue to live, work, and play along our vibrant coast. You will learn more about the work that CRCL does towards these ends and meet several staff engaged in these efforts with the opportunities for Q&A. To kick it off, please enjoy this inspirational film. Five miles an hour, gusts much higher than that, bringing with her all kinds of problems. Buildings have collapsed. There are reports from New Orleans of uh, people to up in New Orleans. Gas tank along the Gulf Coast is not, not only difficult, but very dangerous. The I want to take a moment to extend my gratitude to you, for it is you who have chosen to be here. It is you who live in this time and in this place that we all call home. And it is our home here in Louisiana where our identity and culture reside. So when our home is threatened, that means that our identity and our culture are also threatened. You see, here in Louisiana, we live on the edge where the water laps at the dirt. And though the horizon may be calm and the skies may be blue, we know, oh yes, we know. It seems like just yesterday we were rebuilt. We lost 2,000 brothers and sisters in Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. And then when we thought it couldn't get any worse, our home was soiled with 2 million barrels of oil. But it was you who remained. It was you. And with your help, we were able to maintain our identity and our culture. You were the heroes during those difficult times when we needed you and you remain our heroes. You see, it was 15 years ago that we were smacked upside the head by those two catastrophic storms, Katrina and Rita. It was time and again that you rose. You rose for your home. You rose for your neighbors. You rose for your families and your friends. You rose for yourself. Because here on the edge, we take refuge in one another. We come to each other's aid. This is who we are in Louisiana. We open our hearts. We open our homes. Because we are one. One home. One culture one identity. For a brief moment, it felt like you left. 
To lose your home is to lose your identity. But we are not interested in just mere recovery. No, we are not. We are interested in rediscovery. Every day we wait to discover, to rediscover our nature, to rediscover our culture, to rediscover our past and our childhood. For when you rediscover, you triumphantly crawl out of that hole. Oh, rise! It doesn't matter if you rise under the roof of a steeple or if you rise within the space of your own people. We lift each other up here. From our bones to our homes, we never let others be alone. And so they rise. For when they rise, we all rise. So come together, people. Look at that sky. Close your eyes. Open your heart and see what's at stake. The day is now and the decisions must be profound. Come and stand with me, my brothers, my sisters. Rise, for we will never give up hope. Won't you rise with me? Rise with me. All oh, rise. All oh, rise. Good afternoon. My name is Isabella Donnell, and I'm the Outreach Assistant for Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana. I'm here today to talk to you about Louisiana's coastal history, the challenges it faces, what's being done in response to those challenges, and the ways that the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana is involved. To begin, let's discuss the Mississippi River and its drainage basin. The Mississippi River drainage basin covers 41% of the U.S. This encompasses 31 states and two Canadian provinces. All of the rain that falls within the Mississippi River's drainage basin will eventually drain and pass by us down here in coastal Louisiana. Coastal Louisiana was formed over, with natural processes over thousands of years. Glacial melt slowly brought sediment from the north to the south, building out Louisiana's coastal plain. The coastal plain has two components, the deltaic plain and the chenier plain. In this image, you can see the Mississippi River's path highlighted in blue and the coastal zone highlighted in green. Over the past 7,500 years, the Mississippi River has changed course repeatedly. When it is in one place, it will slowly deposit sediment to begin building out a delta lobe. When it changes course, it will stop depositing sediment on its old route and begin depositing sediment on its new location, which will then begin to build a new lobe. You can see the different lobes that were gradually built out over thousands of years in this image. Louisiana's coast has and always will be a place of change because it is a dynamic environment. With these next few images, I would like for you to focus on the timeline in the top corner to see how land was built over time. As new lobes formed with the river's new routes, land was gradually built up and allowed for marsh plants and trees to take root. These changes happened over thousands of years, which sounds like a long time, but considering that this occurred on a geological time scale, it's actually quite quick. In 1927, the Great Flood occurred, which cost hundreds of lives and thousands of dollars in damages. In response, the federal government gave the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers the responsibility for levying off the river to control flooding. The federal mandate to the Corps dictated that existing levees were to be lifted to new, higher standards, and where there were no river levees on the Mississippi River, they were to be built to these new standards. At the time, there were those who saw the channeling off of the Mississippi River to have negative long-term consequences. However, as settlers continued to build out the region, the threat from flooding to people, industries, and agriculture in the river basin was becoming increasingly costly. Looking back, levying off the Mississippi River is the most significant cause of Louisiana's land loss. The river became constrained by the levees to prevent flooding, 
and so was no longer able to deposit sediment as it had done for thousands of years. This next image represents our modern day river levee system. The red lines are the levees which were put in by the Army Corps in 1927. Notice how the lines are further apart for the Atchafalaya Basin. The levees being spread apart creates a floodplain that can accommodate more water during flood periods. This next slide shows our historic sediment deposition compared to our next slide, which will show our current sediment deposition. Notice the difference and how in the previous slide it was widespread, whereas here we have our sediment, instead of being deposited evenly across our coastal plain, being jettisoned out into the deeper waters of the Gulf. This image was taken May 17, 2011, when the Bonnie Carey spillway was open, which is why we also see sediment being deposited into Lake Pontchartrain. Many factors contribute to the erosion of wetlands in coastal Louisiana, and we will touch on each one of these and the ways that they compound one another. The first factor, which we've touched on, is the river levees. You can see again in this image how, as opposed to having sediment being evenly deposited across our wetlands, it's being shot out into the Gulf and into Lake Pontchartrain, where it cannot accumulate to build land the way it did historically. This image was also taken when the Bonnie Carey spillway was open in 2016. The second factor that we'll touch on is sea level rise, which is a symptom of climate change. So not only are our marshes not being given their annual dose of sediment from river flooding, the seas are also rising. The third factor is oil and gas channels and canals. These canals act as conduits, allowing salt water to intrude into freshwater ecosystems. The canals also cut up patches of marsh into smaller pieces increasing the rate of erosion because of a greater exposed surface area of marsh to the current of the river. As an analogy, you can think of one large ice cube versus a bowl of small ice cubes. Which one is going to be melted quicker? The bowl of small ice cubes will melt faster than the one large ice cube because more surface area of ice cube is being exposed to heat. It's the same thing with the marshes. If you have a large patch of marsh bisected repeatedly by canals, more edge is being exposed to the river, and so the river's flow will erode all of those edges much quicker. Our fourth factor is vegetation dieback. Our coast has marshes ranging from freshwater to brackish to salt. Marsh plants typically only tolerate a particular range of salinity. As sea level rise, salt water gets pushed further inland, particularly during storm season due to storm surge. Freshwater plants will die from the increased salinity, and so all of the soil being held in place by those plants' roots will now get washed away. Our next factor are dams. There are many dams along the way of the Mississippi River, and behind these dams, sediment gets trapped, which means there's a large quantity of sediment being accumulated upriver that never flows or makes its way down to us here in coastal Louisiana. Our next factor is subsidence. Deltaic systems, such as the one we live in, naturally subside over time. However, without the annual input of sediment into our deltaic system, there's nothing to counteract that subsidence. So our soil is continually being compacted and going downward, which is why we have so much cracked up concrete in the city of New Orleans. Another factor is hurricanes. Take a close look at this image. It shows the wetlands in southeast Louisiana before and then after hurricanes Katrina and Rita. You can see how much damage hurricanes do to our coastal wetlands. This yellow arrow points to the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet Canal, which during the storm season acted as a conduit allowing large quantities of salt water to penetrate and damage our marsh systems and the city of New Orleans. The last factor that we'll touch on are invasive species, which are quite common in Louisiana and disruptive to natural ecosystems. In this image on the bottom, we have the nutria rat, which is a large invasive rat that can chew down acres of wetlands at a time because they eat the seedlings or saplings of trees whose roots are needed in order to strengthen and hold our soil together. Wild hogs dig into earth and levees, tear up forests, and destroy agricultural crops, costing billions of dollars across the Gulf South annually. 
Lastly, in this top image, we have the rosocane mealybug, which has been wiping out wetland plants in Plaquemines Parish. In this map of our coast, you can see land change from 1932 to 2010. The red denotes land loss, and you will notice the land gain is very small, but is concentrated where the sediment has been repeatedly being deposited since we built those federal levee systems in 1927. Since 1930s, we've lost approximately 2,000 square miles of land. That's almost the size of Delaware. Within the next 50 years, if we take no action, we stand to lose more than double that. To get a better visual representation of what this land change can look like, here's an aerial photograph of Bayou DuPont taken in 1952, and then in 2005. You'll note that in this image, you can see quite clearly different oil and gas canals that have been dug through the marsh. Land loss and saltwater intrusion doesn't just affect plants and the land and the water. It has consequences for living species in our region, particularly on freshwater aquatic species. Unlike plants that can't move, populations of freshwater fish and shrimp and other critters will try to migrate if their environment doesn't suit them. This in the long term can cause problems for fisheries who are dependent upon a healthy population of fish remaining in the same area over time. If our fishing becomes impacted, that will harm in the long term our state's economy. So in response to sea level rise and flooding, what is being done and how can we protect ourselves? Pontchartrain Conservancy theorized these multiple lines of defense. Our first line of defense are environmental adaptations, things such as barrier islands, sounds, land bridges, healthy marshes, and natural ridges. Our first line of defense emphasizes a healthy ecosystem. Our second line of defense are structural adaptations, such as levees or pumps that help keep water from entering residential areas. Our third line of defense are non-structural adaptations or actions that residents can take, like ensuring they have an evacuation plan in place in the event that a storm makes landfall. So what else is being done to mitigate the impacts of land loss and protect our residents? The Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority is an interagency organization that works collaboratively with different federal and local organizations and stakeholders to create a master plan every six years. The most recent master plan was released in 2017, and we are now working on developing the 2023 master plan. The main goals that drive the decisions behind which projects make it into the master plan are reducing flood risk and building and maintaining land. In this next map, you can see where different projects have been implemented that originated from the master plan. Since 2007, the CPRA has completed or funded for construction a total of 124 projects, resulting in over 802 square miles of land being created, 282 miles of levee improvements being constructed, and over 60 miles of barrier islands and berms being constructed. When designing restoration projects and initiatives, the Coastal Master Plan focuses on the five main objectives, flood protection, natural processes, coastal habitats, cultural heritage, and maintaining a working coast. Within the master plan, there are a variety of different restoration projects listed as you can read in this slide. Our land loss crisis is not caused by one problem and so cannot be fixed simply by one solution. I will next briefly touch on each one of these kinds of restoration projects and please bear in mind that these projects produce the best results when used in concert with each other. First, we'll discuss sediment diversions. Sediment diversions would be structures built into the levee designed to pull sediment from the bottom of the river and divert it into our eroding wetland. This would mimic the natural and historic processes of the river. I say would be because currently there are no sediment diversions constructed in our levees. Next, we have freshwater diversions. Freshwater diversions are designed to bring freshwater from the Mississippi River and divert it to areas that were once freshwater habitats. This is important in order to prevent vegetation die-off for marsh plant species that are sensitive to high salinity 
and to prevent the migration of fish populations that can that prefer freshwater habitats. Next, we have hydrologic restoration. Hydrologic restoration projects control the flow of saltwater or freshwater into an area. In the western part of the state, where they do not have the benefit of the river, maintaining the correct salinity balance is crucial, and hydrologic restoration projects can help with this. An example of a hydrologic restoration project is a backfilling a canal. In 2009, the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet Canal was backfilled with a rock dam to prevent saltwater intrusion from occurring the way that it did during hurricanes Rita and Katrina. And that is an example of hydrologic restoration. There, we also have shoreline protection. Shoreline protection provides a buffer to slow wave energy before it can hit the shore of our marshes. In this image, you can see how the texture of the water is rougher on one side of the rock dam. On the other side, the texture of the water is smoother. Another kind of shoreline protection that is living shoreline protection are oyster reefs. Oyster reefs grow vertically over time as larva settles on old shell, and so it is thought that they will be able to keep pace with sea level rise. Oysters are also a keystone species, meaning many other species depend upon them for food and habitat. And if we are able to construct and implement more oyster reefs, we will have a healthier and more biodiverse ecosystem in our region. And since people love to eat oysters, they're an important part of our local economy. Next, we have barrier islands. The maintenance of our barrier islands are vital for the restoration of our coast. They are used as nesting and resting sites for migratory birds and are our first line of defense in thinking about our multiple lines of defense against knocking down wave energy during storm surges. Barrier island projects use dredged or pumped sand from borrowed sites to rebuild barrier islands after they've been damaged in storms. We also have ridge restoration, which ridges are also a part of our first line of defense when thinking about our multiple lines of defense. Ridges are the result of sediment piling up on the edges of bayous and distributaries over time. They're high places where trees can grow and establish roots in a marshy landscape. This image is an example of a successful marsh and ridge creation in Bayou Grand Yard within the Barataria Basin. And lastly, we have marsh creation. Marsh creation projects are very effective at building land quickly. However, they are expensive. These projects also use dredged sediment to build up a marsh platform. This is an effective way to quickly provide protection in a rapidly eroding area. However, nearly as soon as these marshes are done being built, they are then subject to the consequences of erosion. So while we can build marshes, we can't prevent them from experiencing erosion. However, if we were to implement sediment diversions, these marshes that we build would then have a way to receive sediment and maintain themselves over time. And so what might our coast look like if we choose to act on our master plan and implement multiple restoration initiatives? Think back to the map we saw earlier and how much was red compared to how much was green. While there is still red, there is a lot more green. We stand to gain much more land if we choose to act than not. And so how is CRCL playing a role in our coastal restoration? We'll cover this in our next segment. CRCL's mission is to drive bold science-based action in order to sustain a dynamic and coastal Louisiana through engagement and advocacy. Our vision is a thriving coastal Louisiana sustained by systems that support healthy wetlands and barrier islands that benefit both people and nature. We do this primarily through our habitat restoration programs, of which we have three, marsh grass plantings to restore our coastal marshes, coastal forest restoration to maintain the health of our swamps, and dune plantings and beach restorations in order to help maintain our barrier islands. Since the year 2000, CRCL has engaged over 14,000 volunteers who have helped to plant 3.3 million species of native plants across coastal Louisiana. And then to monitor and ensure that the success of our planting projects, each year we will return to the sites where we had a planting project 
and take drone footage and count data. This image shows the before and after one year apart of a successful beach planting in Grand Terre. We also take drone footage in order to monitor our plantings, particularly of tree plantings. This image shows Manchac land bridge before and after one of our tree plantings. Our counted survival rate for trees that we have planted are above 80%. And if you're wondering what those plastic cylinders are in the after image, they are nutria excluder devices, which are designed to prevent nutria rats from chewing down these young saplings before they've had a chance to establish themselves. CRCL also has an oyster shell recycling program, wherein we collect shell from restaurants that we partner with in New Orleans, take it to a curing site where it is cleaned and let cured over time. We then bag the shell and put it into crates, as you can see in the bottom image, where it then goes off the coast to protect the shoreline of our marshes. The bag shell acts as a base for baby oyster larvae to settle onto and grow and over time becomes an oyster reef. If you would like to get involved with CRCL at any of our plantings, please visit our website and you will be able to navigate to our volunteer sign up page. Listed here are other ways for you to be involved if you're interested. Thank you very much for your time today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email myself or my colleague. And I hope you have a wonderful day. All right, we thank you again for joining and hope that you enjoyed our commemorative inspirational video um, and that you are now a little more informed about our coastal challenges and hopes for the future after that great presentation by Isabella. Now we're gonna go ahead and take just a few minutes to open it up for some questions uh, or comments from the audience. Go ahead and feel free to chat into the live Q&A. Uh, let us know what resonated or if you want something further explained or you have another a question about anything that was presented. And so first up, we have a question here by Raymond Sweet, um, who wants to know if any of the restoration near is occurring near oil fields and if so do the oil fields contribute to erosion um, that's kind of a little bit of a complex question so um, i guess the the short shortest answer i could give is that one of the the biggest impacts related to oil and gas fields and and specifically their exploration that occurred um, pretty rampantly from the you know around the late 40s until the the 70s um, was the fact that many canals were cut either to access different areas of the wetlands to to drill and to try to find oil uh, for exploration um, and then once oil was found many more canals were cut that then were used to transport that oil to refinery facilities um, so the 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 initial blow to our wetlands in that context is that the digging of all of these navigation and exploration and, and pipeline canals. Going back to the analogy that that uh, Bella used, if you think of our, our marshland as a historically one big block of ice, and as we chop that up into a bunch of little ice cubes, that block of ice has much less surface area to succumb to the forces of erosion or on its perimeter. Once you crisscross that with oil and gas canals and chop it all up, now you've you've exponentially increased the amount of surface area that then succumbs to erosion from tides and storm surge and things like that. Um, historically, way back in the day, there there was uh, um, a lack of what they they since have implemented as far as um, back pumping wells and so there was there is some science that shows that when some of these subsurface areas were drained that 
it, it did exacerbate land collapse uh, when the salt water and the, the space then just kind of fell in on itself. Good question though. And someone else has typed in, how do you choose where to do restoration projects? Um, so we, we personally, CRCL, when we get volunteers out doing restoration projects, we look at a number of factors. We look at the, the environmental conditions that currently exist. Uh, we factor in how those conditions are likely to change in the near future. Um, we want to make sure that we're matching, obviously, the right types of plants and vegetation to the right types of habitat and, and conditions. Um, so as an example, cypress trees really cannot take uh, a lot of uh, salt water or recurring exposure to salt water. Um, and so you want to make sure you're planting those near freshwater inputs and, and higher up in the, in the system. Um, as far as how the state uh, CPRA uh, chooses where their projects go, they, they use a, um, a modeling and pro project prioritization tool. Um, essentially, they plug in all of the different great ideas for projects, and then through this, this tool and modeling, they are able to determine which projects will offer the most amount of land building that that will be maintained for the largest amount longest amount of time into the future and also it helps them to, to determine should we do project a before project b before project c um, and and so that projects are complementing and being as synergistic as possible so Someone asked if we could talk a bit more about the Rosocane mealybug. Um, I have not heard about this as a cause of wetland loss before now. Um, perhaps we could tee that up for our, our uh, concluding Q&A. Uh, we have a couple of people on staff that, that are well more versed in, um, in vegetation than, than I am. Um, what I could tell you and relate to you from, from news coverage and, and media that, that I've read, um, is that this is a bug that that popped up um, within the the past five years where it had not really been seen on our landscape before. Um, Rosocane is is a very important vegetation type, especially further down in the system, like around the the mouth of the Mississippi River down south of Venice. Um, it 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 does a wonderful job in the way that it grows and roots in being able to to maintain soil but then also along the river where there's a lot of natural sediment allowing that sediment to to fall out as it flows through the stalks of the rosocane uh, during high river and then as the river settles it's constantly creating new new land um, as we lose those rosocanes and hence the the roots and the vegetation that 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 is um, you know dying with the cane, um, then that soil is exposed, so it, the soil erodes. But then it's also not slowing down the water and not acting uh, as a sediment capture. So if you have any other questions, go ahead and queue them up. We're going to have myself and Isabella, as well as the rest of the team, or not the full team, but a good handful of our team um, on at the end for about 20 minutes to conclude. Uh, and so we'll be able to answer any other questions about this. Um, right now, we're going to go ahead and, and shift gears a little bit. Uh, we're going to uh, show you some content and, and introduce you to a little bit more in depth some of the work that CRCL does uh, and some of the staff that are leading those efforts. So we'll, we're going to begin with a, a nice uh, rather artistic portrayal of a recycled oyster shell as it goes from harvest to consumption to restoration. Uh, it's a video produced by uh, New Orleans filmmaker and cinematographer Pavo Henanen. Uh, after that we'll hear from uh, three different presentations about uh, three programs that we have, our youth engagement initiative, our volunteer planting efforts, uh, and as well, more in depth about how our actual oyster shell recycling program constructs living shorelines. And we'll then have plenty of time for some more Q&A. 
Uh, and with that, let's go ahead and shift to the video. Keep the Q&A coming. Hey everyone, just bear with us one second. We're uh, having to restart uh, the video to make sure that we have it playing succinctly. So uh, thank you for your patience and we will resume just momentarily.
while we are queuing that up, uh, we can go ahead and answer, uh, answer another question that came in. Um, someone asked, has the Mardi Gras pass been studied for its impact? Um, yes, the Mardi Gras pass is actually being quite thoroughly studied. Uh, our partners at the Potch and Train Conservancy uh, have been doing uh, con some considerable monitoring since they, they first identified that that pass was created. Um, as Bella talked about in, in her presentation, the the Mississippi River and its natural processes always wants to try to find the shortest route from the, the headwaters all the way up in Minnesota and Canada to get down to, to the Gulf of Mexico. And, and the creation of Mardi Gras Pass was just one example of nature's processes playing out uh, in this manner. And so uh, it, Mardi Gras Pass was, was first observed in, in 2012 um, ever since. Uh, as the pass has has gone through the natural processes of developing its channel and developing its outfall areas, um, uh, th there has been a lot of monitoring that has been done, uh, both in the the actual um, hydrology and the the actual you know bathymetry, the depth and the the width of the the channel itself, um, as as well as where that sediment is going. Um, I was actually fortunate enough to get out on a boat just uh, three weeks ago uh, and go from inside the, the river's channel through the pass uh, into some of the bays and bayous that that are actually being newly formed and created uh, as a result of, the, of that Mardi Gras pass dumping sediment. It's a, if you ever have a chance to get out in that area, it is a, a fabulous, fabulous experience where you can see a abundance of wildlife, new willow trees, um, new vegetation taking hold, um, open bays that were eroding and, and just becoming wider and wider and, and bigger and bigger uh, are now actually getting sediment deposited to where you'll hit a sandbar that was five feet of water um, just a few um, years ago, if not a year before. And, and so there's been a lot of uh, wonderful development. Another question comes in from uh, Shade Winfrey. How has the pandemic impa impacted volunteer opportunities and where do you see things going into the future? Um, so, you know, CRCL and, and uh, our programs were, were not uh, impervious to uh, the, you know, the challenges and threats of, of the pandemic. Um, and um, of course, as far as protocols for for safety and social distancing. Um, we had to to temporarily pause all of our volunteer programs and, and events. Um, you know, historically and traditionally, we would get a bunch of people um, out sometimes packed tight on a boat or in a in a, a van to get out to location. Um, we would have people, you know, strangers who would meet up and work in small groups uh, in very close quarters. So um <clears throat> so uh, yes we uh had to rethink our our volunteer program and um we did end up successfully kind of retooling to where we we had um you know socially distanced uh protocols in place uh that did allow people who were already kind of in their in their quarantine pod to come out in small groups and to work together um and we were able to successfully do a few uh cypress tree plantings um and we are very excited to be getting kicked back up to speed uh, with a, a full plans to resume uh, both our, our volunteer events as well as um, our, our planting events as well as our oyster shell recycling. And at the end of this program, we'll have a little bit of time to hear maybe about some specific opportunities coming up to those ends. I believe we will be queuing up the video to resume the content. But please feel free to uh, keep any questions coming in the meantime.
far as I can remember, as, as back when uh, Jean Lafitte and the British and all was here, the Indians were picking up oysters on the banks over here, and they were bit, that was their major food. Before an oyster was ever sold, it was the Indians, that uh, the natives of Louisiana, that showed us about the oysters. That was their main, uh, one of their main courses on the menu because the oysters were there on the shoreline and they could go on it. You know, it, it wasn't something they had to go hunt for. When we, they first started harvesting oysters in this bay, it was all sails. So you, would, you had a sail on your boat and you would pull the dredge on the side and the momentum of the boat, that's how you got the dredge up. You see that piling over there? My grandpa had two camps there and my dad worked for my grandpa and my whole family was always the people. But they had islands with uh, people living on it all over here. Years, years ago. Like this, this lake right here was full of islands, they're all going. Vanished. It's all going. It, the damage is done. Too little, too late. You know what I mean? It's a rock. I guess this is straining the whole sea out. And he said, let me see if I can try this. And I guess it, they figured it was a food that they can eat. What do the, what are the thing? Because it's alive before you open it, you know? So I think they have a mind of its own, you know? Don't eat me, I guess, you know? Don't fish me out the sea.
the north and south pole is, is, is melting, is melting, and all that water have to come somewhere, so it's coming down here by us. And we, we, we bring this 20 yard can and we dump the shells on, in, the, in the rock place, in, in the rock shell place. They pick them up, put them on a barge, they, they bring them to the marsh, and they kind of fill the marshes up with them. The wildlife is, is, is catching hell right about now. They, they, they're gonna be knocking on your door in a minute. They ain't got nowhere else to go, they, so they're coming to us, you know what I'm saying? You know, so long as we can keep doing what we're doing, it'll be all right for them. You know, they got somewhere to, somewhere to, how do you say that? Somewhere to, to chill out. If you think of uh, think of a mound of soil with water rushing by it, you can you can visualize how that would eat away at the soil. But if you imagine uh, what is really sort of a rock wall in front of that, it, it protects it from that movement of the water. We deposit them into these marine grade mesh bags, and then um, we'll we'll put the bags of the shell into a steel cage called a gabion, and then we'll have a contractor lift the steel cages, put them on a barge and go out to our reef site and place them where we have determined is the best spot for them to create an oyster reef. Oyster reefs, of course, have the remarkable ability to adapt for sea level rise so they can continue to grow up if the water level goes up, uh, whereas if you built uh, a reef out of concrete or something, it could not do that. Um, so yes, we can win this, but uh, whether we uh, whether we have the fortitude to do that remains to be seen. It's a it, it's all a big mess created by man, and man is trying to undo that mess. go to Florida, the Everglades is a very beautiful place, but it's not like it is here. Um, it, it's just, it's, I don't know. And there's nothing better than waking up and getting on one of these boats. You know, when you, when you grow up in that concrete jungle, the city, you know, you don't really understand you know how things get to your plate or you know what i mean and and out here you know we eat from the land you know our ancestors ate from the land um there was a story by my grandmother that was 100 years old and she said that uh you know during the great depression in the early 1900s there was no great depression in lafitte because there it didn't matter if they had money or not they had plenty of food from the waterways We also understand the ecology and, and the balance of uh, life. You know that you can't take too much from from this, or something else happens. You know something has to die in order for something to live.
Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Hannah and I'm going to be talking a little bit about CRCL's student engagement programs. And we have a couple different programs um, at both the high school and the college level. So at the high school level, it's called Future Coastal Leaders. And at the college and university level, we have the Student Ambassador Program. And the idea for these programs is really that we're trying to help develop the next generation of coastal leaders. So I'll get started. Uh, like I said, my name is Hannah Cohen. I'm the Community Engagement Associate for Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana, and I'm also a program coordinator for our Future Coastal Leaders program. So why do we do student engagement programs? CRCL really saw an opportunity for more youth engagement and motivation at both the high school level and at the college and university level. At the high school level, we really saw the junior and senior years of high school as this impressionable period, a moment when students are deciding on their projected path through college, uh, technical training, or entering into the workforce. And we really wanted to light that spark of interest in coastal. Um, and college is similarly an important time to capture the minds and passion of young people who are just starting to discover what they want to do with their lives and with their careers, um, looking into different fields of study. Uh, and so this is really an opportunity to provide some hands-on experience and see if Coastal is something that they're interested in doing uh, and to really spark that passion. There definitely is also an opportunity in the coastal restoration economy for Louisiana moving forward. Uh, so whether that be through large scale restoration projects, engineering projects, um, government agencies, and regulatory agencies, or community outreach and community groups, um, there's a whole host of opportunities and jobs within that new restoration economy that we really want to introduce youth to. Make sure that they know how to get the training, uh, the right kind of educa education um, that they need to pursue those careers. And then this is also definitely an equity and justice issue. Right now, a room full of coastal professionals does not reflect the diversity of our coastal communities. And we know that young people of color are especially underrepresented in our coastal field. And that really hinders our ability to address intersectional challenges and priorities for Gulf Coast communities who are affected by land loss and need to be part of the solutions. Um, and to be so in ways that are equitable and just and inclusive. And so that's um, part of what we're trying to accomplish with this program. Uh, and so CRCL believes we have the knowledge, the resources, and the networks to help increase access and connect youth to the field. And so the Future Coastal Leaders High School program has a, a number of goals. We're trying to inspire the next generation of professionals working to fight coastal land loss and climate change, really by highlighting these many different kinds of careers and degrees that, that exist that address our coastal and environmental issues. We're also trying to help youth understand our coastal issues and restoration solutions and become advocates for their own communities. And we're doing this by uh, helping to build leadership skills, giving them some resources in preparation for college and careers, um, and facilitating different conversations with these students. Uh, and we're also providing networking and real world exposure to the coastal restoration field here in Louisiana. So some of the key elements of the Future Coastal Leaders Program are educational opportunities, experiential learning, and resources and networking. So for educational opportunities, um, the students have an opportunity to attend a range of sessions. Over the last semester, we had uh, around 15 different uh, in virtual events um, and a couple in-person opportunities for the students to attend. And those range from on a series of coast different coastal topics. We learned about climate change, green infrastructure, our multiple lines of defense strategy. Um, we learned uh, about indigenous sovereignty and connections to coastal issues um, and much more. We, we worked with a number of uh, community leaders and speakers uh, and partners like Pontchartrain Conservancy. Um, and those were all really valuable experiences. We also were interested in providing experiential learning to the students. Um, and so this, we had a little bit of a hiccup during COVID. We definitely wanted to provide more in-person uh, events like CRCL's volunteer planting days and our oyster cell recycling opportunities. Um, but the students got a little taste of that and um, going forward, they definitely will. Um, and we also have invited them to attend Restoration on the Half Shell. So hopefully some of them are watching now and our State of the Coast Conference so they can um, network and learn that way. And we've provided things like advocacy workshops and science labs to get them some of that hands-on learning as well. And finally, we wanted to, we've definitely provided a lot of different kinds of resources for the students, including um, resources around different fields of study and careers that they could get into, um, information about scholarships and educational programs at different colleges and universities and technical programs that they might be interested in looking into, and really providing that networking experience so that the students can 
uh, talk with each other, network with our student ambassadors at the college and university level, talk to conference attendees um, and CRCL partners, and really create their own alumni network as well that they can engage going forward. And so um, when we think about a successful program for uh, the future coastal leaders, I think that really looks like a diverse set of graduates who are really engaged coastal advocates. So students that if they go to college or university, go on to become student ambassadors uh, and continue to engage with the students who volunteer and engage with us and our partners um, around the coast uh, beyond the program and just generally students who pursue coastal education programming, trainings or careers uh, in the so moving on to the student ambassador program. Um, the picture here is Isabella Donnell. She's a Serve Louisiana member uh, serving as our outreach assistant and program coordinator for the student ambassador program. Uh, so a little more information on that. Uh, for the student ambassador program, it's open to any full-time student at any college or university uh, in Louisiana that we've focused mainly on coastal colleges and universities. Um, and all they have to do is attend an orientation where they meet with other students and set expectations for the semester. Uh, and commit to fulfilling a certain number of service hours over the course of a semester. And that's changed a little bit um, over the years, but uh, generally it's around 30 hours of service. And they, they also commit to attending um, a series of group meetings. And similarly to the Future Coastal Leaders Program, they have educational opportunities, experiential learning. Um, for educational opportunities, they're attending webinars at each other's universities, webinars from CRCL and our Restore the Mississippi River Delta partners. Um, they're participating in volunteer days with us and with partner organizations. And they're also working on creative projects of their own. And so these uh, over during the course of COVID were digital projects, but they can be physical as well, um, whether they're research projects or art projects, something uh, that's designed to be informative, engaging and shareable on a topic related to coastal restoration that the student works on over the course of the semester. And these are all different ways that they can earn their service hours for the program. Here's a little snapshot of some of the students um, at their biweekly meetings where they would hear from professionals in the field, discuss their projects, uh, learn networking skills, and learn about coastal restoration projects and opportunities to get involved, um, take part in public events on different projects. Um, lots of great opportunities. And so this program has been really useful because students use um, what they've learned in their experience to really inform their majors, their fields of study, um, what they're interested in pursuing as a career, what they want to do for work over the summer. They use the program as a reference on scholarships and internship application. And right now we do have representation from a majority of coastal Louisiana colleges and universities, which has been great to see. Uh, and the students also create their own alumni network, um, engaging with themselves and previous graduates, um, keeping in touch with CRCL. And we help track uh, the extent to which they end up embarking on coastal careers and using what they've learned throughout the program. So for both of these programs, you can learn more on our website at crcl.org. You can email me at hannah.cohen at crcl.org. Um, and I just encourage anyone who uh, is either in high school or college who is interested in getting more into coastal, learning uh, more about the field um, and gaining some contacts and experience uh, to, to get involved or if you know anyone who would be interested in the program, um, please reach out to us. Thanks so much. Hey, I'm Kat. I'm the Habitat Restoration Coordinator at Coalition to Restore Coast Louisiana. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about our Habitat Restoration Program and the impact of our plantings in a short Q&A session. So we'll go ahead and get started with why is it critical to restore Louisiana's coastal habitat? Well, Louisiana's wetlands are vitally important to our way of life. They supply the seafood that we all love, which supports our economy, but they also provide habitat um, for important species that depend on our estuaries. Um, but most importantly, they mitigate storms and flooding, which helps to reduce impact from storm damage. 
So how much land has Louisiana lost? Well, since the 1930s, we've lost over 2,000 square miles of land. And most of this land has been the wetlands that protect coastal residents against hurricanes and storms and provides these various ecological services to both human communities and wildlife. So what types of plantings do we facilitate? Well, we coordinate and hold marsh grass and beach dune grass plantings, as well as coastal forest restoration projects. So we try to engage volunteers and stakeholders to be a part of the solution by facilitating environmental stewardship and giving community members opportunities to participate in this hands-on restoration work. We always plant native species that are naturally found in the areas we are restoring. These plants are effective soil stabilizers and they're used extensively for erosion control. So where do our volunteer plantings take place? Well, our habitat restoration program has had volunteer events ranging all across our coast, from the beaches of Cameron Parish on Louisiana's west coast to the swamps and marshes in Plaquemines and St. Tammany Parish on Louisiana's east coast. So why is planting vegetation one of the most effective tools for enhancing coastal habitats? Well, it helps to prevent shoreline erosion. It promotes rapid colonization of marsh vegetation, which stabilizes the marsh edge. And it helps to prevent wetlands from turning into open water. Um, our plantings have actually helped stabilize thousands of acres of wetlands, coastal forests, and beaches along our coast. So how do we choose our sites? Well, we focus on restoring the wetland environments that have been impacted by coastal land loss. So the sites that we choose are critical lines of defense for surrounding communities. These areas have been by man-made and natural changes to the floodplain of the lower Mississippi River Delta, um, impacting its health and stability. So a few examples are logging, saltwater intrusion from canals, invasive species, subsidence. Some of these areas have been severely impacted by hurricanes and also, of course, levees, which were originally built for flood protection. But in the long run, they reduced the natural input of sediment into the system, which was essential for offsetting subsidence. So how do we monitor our plantings? Well, our coastal scientists will take baseline data before or right after each planting, whether that means setting up plots to assess the success of our grass plantings or individually measuring and tagging a certain percentage of trees before they go into the ground. And then we will follow up with each site annually um, to measure the conditions of successful growth and also the percent survival rate. So to answer our last question and kind of sum up some of the things we talked about today, how are CRCL's plantings beneficial? Well, not only does our program provide valuable education experiences for volunteers to take this meaningful action that has a long-term positive impact on our coastal habitats, um, our plantings also reduce the impacts from subsidence, as well as providing these critical storm buffers, which reduces the flood risk for Louisiana's coastal and inland communities. Um, the plants that we plant will grow dense root systems that will hold sediment from the river in place while the body of the plant absorbs wave energy and height as storms come through. The return of the natural hydrology of the area will also help to improve the reproduction and recruitment of the native plants planted, which enhances the ecology of these areas, um, providing essential habitat for fish and wildlife. And lastly, um, our plantings help to support the larger restoration efforts in these areas um, by filling in the gaps left by the larger projects. So examples are marsh creation projects and the planned sediment diversion. And that's all I have for you guys today. So if anybody wants to get muddy with us and would like to volunteer for an upcoming event, visit our website, crsale.org, and we hope to see you guys out in the future. We are out here at our shell curing site in Beerus Boat Harbor, um, down in Plaquemines Parish. We're 
almost at the bird's foot delta end of the Mississippi River. And this is where we collect and store oyster shell that has been collected for our oyster shell recycling program. So this program began in 2013 and uh, it began with a pilot grant from Shell, which um, we used to work together with restaurants uh, to see how we could avoid um, this natural resource ending up in landfills instead of in our coastal waters where it can do so much good. We're putting the oyster shell out in a structure that'll help it hold its form until it can grow and be a self-sustaining reef. So, you know, our our mission is to um, put these in places where they're going to help slow coastal erosion and reduce land loss. There are so many ways that people can get involved with CRCL and our oyster shell recycling program. Um, from the simplest way as patronizing our partner restaurants and slurping down some oysters, um, to rolling up your sleeves and getting your hands dirty with volunteering at our oyster shell recycling events. Right now we have about 19 partner restaurants our restaurant partners actually uh, do pay a fee to participate to help us offset the costs of the recycling. The oyster shells are picked up by our recycling contractor and they bring it on down here to Buris and that is where the shells will then cure. So these need to sit out for um, a minimum of six months so that the sun and the air can break down any sort of food or bacteria um, left on the shells and that they're clean and ready to go into the water. We chose this site specifically because Hackberry Bay contains one of the state's oyster seed grounds. And if this strip of marsh erodes away, then the seed grounds could be threatened by increased salinity and increased risk for what comes along with that, which is uh, oyster disease and oyster predators. We have deployed um, nearly 800 cubic yards of oyster shell, which is about 800 tons. And today we're deploying the last dozen or so of those uh, reef units. Our contractors are lifting these gabion units up off of this deployment vessel and lowering them on top of this geotextile fabric. And you can see we're just a couple of feet off of the edge of the marsh. And so this will allow us to slow the erosion of the marsh by acting as a wave break. These reefs will develop into living shorelines. Furthermore, as new oyster larvae that's naturally in the water column settles on them and grows. This project is also a climate adaptation project in that oyster reefs, when placed under the right conditions of salinity and current and oxygen, can grow in three dimensions and in theory keep pace with projected sea level rise, which we know is happening. Louisiana depends on the health of its coast. These features out here are protecting us from storm surge. They're providing for us the abundant seafood that comes to our dinner tables, grows out here in our estuaries. So healthy estuaries are necessary to protect us physically and to help us make of life and our culture.
All right. Well, thank you for bearing with us with a little bit of that technical difficulty. We hope that you are able to enjoy the, the video and uh, get to learn a little bit more about some of our programs and, and how we actually get oyster shells back into the water. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just quickly introduce a few other members of staff, uh, some of those that you've seen in some of the videos and uh, and maybe a couple that that uh, are newer and 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 uh, so I'll go ahead and just recap in case you've joined. I'm Corey Miller. I direct our community resilience for CRCL. Um, and uh, just one thing that I really love about uh, this work in our coast is uh, nothing makes me happier than when I get to get out on a boat, catch a fish or some crabs, come home and share a meal with my friends. And, and the ability of having that, that natural resource and that bounty here uh, is why I really love our coast. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, Pass it off. Hey, um, I'm, my name's Hannah Cohen. I'm the Community Engagement Associate for CRCL. And uh, one thing I really love and appreciate about um, living and working here on the coast is um, I really appreciate the way that people here have really culturally informed connections to the land and the water and with the kind of diversity of people and, and cultures and communities that, that call the coast home, that's really reflected in everything from food to music to just um, our understandings of how to live with nature. And um, I love living amongst that and experiencing that with everyone. Pass it on. Hi everybody, my name is Isabella Donnell and I'm a Serve Louisiana member serving as CRCL's Outreach Assistant and Program Coordinator for the Student Ambassador Program. What I really enjoy about living along our coastline is the continued warm weather. Um, I'm a little bit of a reptile and I really enjoy how much sunshine we get and how we are kept warm from the waters of the coast. And I'll pass it forward. Hey everybody, I am James Karst. I am the Director of Communications and Marketing at the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana. Um, I love a lot of things about South Louisiana, but um, I especially love the city of New Orleans and uh, our music and uh, our restaurants and oysters and crawfish. And I could go on and on, but I am going to hand off now. I'm Kat. I'm the Habitat Restoration Coordinator at CRCL, so I facilitate the volunteer plantings. Um, I love living in coastal Louisiana because I'm just always surrounded by these beautiful wetlands, and I love being able to work in the wetlands because it's just such a beautiful environment. I'll pass it on. I'm on mute. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. My name is Kellen LaCour Connett and I'm the Restoration Programs Director with CRCL. And my favorite thing about living in Louisiana and working here, um, this is my home and I just love being able to give back to our coastal residents and, and work hard every day to keep us safe and keep future generations safe and enjoying the wetlands that make our home so special and unique. Next. <laughs> if anybody has any further questions, please uh, feel free to, to type them into the Q&A. Uh, we've been trying to, to multitask and stay on top of providing some replies in line. Um, there's been a lot of good uh, discussion. Um, shout out to, to Raymond, who, who is thrown a couple of really uh, intriguing questions in there and hopefully we've provided some some links. Um, in the meantime, if we see until we see something else come up, maybe Kat, if you're willing to just quickly let the people know how they could um, find out more about upcoming volunteer events and maybe some of the things tease some of the things we have in the pipeline. Sure. So we have some volunteer events coming up in the fall and winter of this year. We'll have our marsh grass planting, uh, beach dune grass planting, and trees plantings um, coming up in September and potentially October and then November, December. 
And if you guys want to volunteer, you can go to our website, crcl.org, and you can sign up for our volunteer list and we'll periodically send out emails with these links to the registration for these events. And they're a lot of fun, you get to plant some native species around coast Louisiana. So I encourage everyone to at least try it out. James, why don't you go ahead and tell the crowd how they could follow us on some of our social media handles. Hey, uh, I think I'm unmuted. Can you all hear me? All right, yeah. Um, another uh, great way to follow our volunteer events or other things that we're doing are to follow us on our social media. Um, we are active on most platforms, not yet on TikTok, but we will be one day. Um, but we announce our volunteer events uh, on our Twitter and on our Facebook. Um, so look there and uh, we hope to see you out in the field and elsewhere. Well, we want to be mindful of everyone's time and we uh, do very much so appreciate everyone showing up. Uh, we encourage you if uh, interested to check out um, our um, full State of the Coast conference. Uh, but before we get to that in a couple of weeks, which occurs June 2nd, 3rd and 4th, uh, we <clears throat> uh, do have two more days of programming of our restoration on the half shell. Um, we thank you very much for uh, working working through a virtual format with us. This is a this is a learning experience and and a, a new way of of you know for us to to hold this space. Um, I will put out a little teaser that this is something that uh, we love to do. We love engaging with community members and uh, potentially we'll be looking to to hold this more often than every other year and try to go to a every year format. Um, a little bit of a, a teaser as far as the the content and and what you have in store um, coming up tomorrow so we will have um, <clears throat> uh, tomorrow beginning at 5 30 p.m in the evening uh, we'll have another hour and a half program um, we have an exciting uh, program tomorrow where we will have three environmental journalists covering some of the prominent issues regarding our coast that tend to come up in the news so uh, when you we knew crack open your newspaper or, or go online in the morning and you see coastal news, some of the topics uh, that, that you keep seeing over and over again. Um, we're gonna go ahead and dig into those with three presentations. We'll have Bob Marshall who will discuss uh, the need to address climate change and the impacts for our coast if we do or do not. Mark Schlefstein will explain the current opportunity to weigh in on the mid Barataria sediment diversion. Uh, Tegan Winland will cover the topic of retreat and relocation for our coastal communities. Um, and then all three will be joined by Amy Wold, who will moderate a panel discussion. Um, in the meantime, feel free to go to crcl.org, learn more about our organization as well in the, the hub portal. Go ahead and go to the exhibit hall and check out uh, our sponsors and our community partners. See you tomorrow.